This is Woke Wars, a podcast by the Miami Herald's opinion team, where we look behind Florida's culture wars. Welcome to Woke Wars. I'm Nancy Ann, reporting from WLRN Studios in Miami. I'm joined by Amy Driscoll from the Miami Herald Editorial Board and audience engagement producer Lauren Costantino. The term parental rights has become a popular platform in education politics. Governor Ron DeSantis has used the term to describe a movement that is designed to give parents more control over how their child is educated. The term has shown up time and again in the legislature. The parental rights in education law passed last year prohibits classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity in grades K through three. It bans any instruction that is not age appropriate for students. There's also legislation that would bar children from attending drag shows with quote unquote lewd performances. This year's expansion of the law bars educators from using a child's preferred pronouns and gives the state more control over sex education materials. Those who support parental rights, at least the kind that DeSantis promotes, see these laws as necessary protections. Here's what the governor said. In Florida, uh, we not only know that parents have a right to be involved, uh, we insist that parents have a right to be involved. But some parents see the outrage these issues have unleashed as distractions from other, more pressing issues that parents deal with every day in schools. Lauren, you talked to some parents. What did they have to say? Yeah, um, you know, as a former high school English teacher, I'm pretty familiar with the parental rights issue. And, you know, I I know, I don't think anyone's arguing that uh, parental engagement in schools is not important. I think it definitely is important to a student's success. But, you know, the problem that I have with the parental rights issue as the way that lawmakers are framing it right now is that I think it's focused on the wrong issues. I think it's There's a bit of a disconnect between what's happening in the classroom and what most parents are concerned about and what lawmakers are saying parents are concerned about. On the ground level, um, parents are worried about so many other things when it comes to schools, right? Uh, We talked to a parent, um, actually politically conservative parent, who is concerned about things like safety, you know, is her son getting to and from school safely? you know, bullying, cyberbullying, um, and also feeling like she's not um, being heard at her son's school and having difficulty actually getting through, um, you know, getting an appointment with the principal and being able to speak about things that she's concerned about. But I think we have to talk about the politics of this, too. Um, I am, you're a former teacher, I'm a former politics editor (laughs) and reporter. Um, And to me, I see this through the the lens of politics. And um, we have a very clever governor who is extremely good at taking, you know, issues that are legitimately of concern to some people and turning them into very big political issues. And I think that's what's happening here. I mean, for example, I don't think there are a thousand kids going to lewd drag shows every week, but from the amount of attention that we've spent in this state on that issue, you would think so, right? Um, This is all coming with a backdrop of a of a governor who obviously is is gonna is considering running for the presidency and probably will, and um, I think that's that puts this in a very deeply political light for me. Absolutely, this seems to go back to um, the governor learning uh, and being really willing to flex his muscles during COVID. I mean, none of this was happening at school board meetings before. And when I say none of this, I mean the protests and the parents showing up um, with uh, really specific anti-woke agendas. And it was during COVID that um, Governor DeSantis realized, you know, I can tell people what to do. I can tell elected officials what to do, and they will be scared. I can get people onto the school boards to do my bidding, and my bidding will be my anti-woke agenda. Right, and and COVID was also the first time that parents were able to see directly into the classroom and what their um, children were learning about. And I think, you know, that transparency is a good thing, but it also 
breed some mistrust, you know, it also, um, you know, um, kind of, you know, I, what I want to say is that parents have always been encouraged to engage, um, you know, in schools. As a teacher, you know, we have always tried to get parents to come into the classroom. You know, I remember making calls to parents after school on a Friday to remind their, um, you know, about their child's Saturday tutoring and things like that. But, you know, uh, during COVID, you know, people really started to want to get involved. And, um, you know, I think it's just escalated into this movement that has gotten out of control. I mean, we shouldn't be banning every single book that's in the library just because somebody thinks that, you know, there's a little bit of inappropriate content in that book. I mean, we have to draw the line somewhere. And that has happened where they are covering up those bookshelves, at least on the west coast of Florida for a while, because the teachers were concerned about violating the law. They weren't sure how they might do that. And it was a felony. So yeah. so they were, they were, you know, trying to protect themselves from being arrested and right. charged. It's understandable. Right. Um, but we do a lot of things in this state these days on the for the kids label. I mean, that's that has become um, a really effective political tool. You know, again, I'm going to look at it from poli- the political side. That is a, you know, parents are are politically active. They, that's a way into to, you know, energize them to go into the polls um, and uh, the governor has figured that out, you know, very clearly. He's not the only one in the country by far, but um, this whole idea of, um, you know, let's let's talk about how important it is that your children don't get indoctrinated in the schools. Well, you know, the schools have standards; they have review boards. They, it's all it, it has always been that way. Are there things happening there that shouldn't be? Probably. I mean, that's always the case in any system, right? But um, I feel like this is still, in the end, uh, you know, a real, a real political move and, uh, you know, and possibly at the, you know, to the, to the, you know, not necessarily helping all of the kids that need the help. Right. And getting the right kind of help. And let's be clear, I think that when uh, DeSantis and his supporters talk about parents' rights, let's be clear that I think they're talking mostly about white parents' rights who the rights of white parents who agree with them. We have talked to, we have read about parents of LGBTQ students who are feeling targeted and just lost in the wilderness and actually afraid to send their kids to school given the languaging uh, targeting transgender and LGBTQ students. There are black parents who do not feel included in parental rights, in having some African-American history deemed not of any educational value. So there are parents and there are parents. Right, and also parents of students with disabilities. Like there's so many groups that are not being um, asked, you know, and talked to about this. Um, And I think, you know, the rhetoric is really divisive. Um, if you want to unify parents on an issue, I think we can all agree that school safety and, you know, preventing mass shootings from happening in schools is an issue that, you know, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, you're going to be concerned about that. And I think people would rather see our state legislature making laws to protect students from physical violence than, you know, concepts that might make them feel uncomfortable or that they might disagree with. And we, when, when we talked with, with Summer Brugal, our, our education reporter, that was one of the things that she told us was that um, school safety, you know, is my child going to come home today, is probably the most pressing thing that she hears from everybody all the time. And yet that's not the thing that's, that's getting all the, all the discussion in Tallahassee. Um, instead, it's issues that, you know, are, what's, the, what's the pronoun we're going to be using in school? And, and, you know, that seems to be as many parents have found, a distraction from some of the other stuff. And yet, what do we hear? We hear over and over about the woke issues, the, you know, the, 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 the textbooks, the drag queens, the pronouns, the black history. You know, we can go on and on. It's always for the kids. But in the end, you know, is it really for the kids or is it for the, for the adults who are running for office? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, Lauren, you mentioned people could, parents could, um, unify um, around school safety, but unity isn't the purpose here. No. Unity does not does not bring in the votes. Right. Uh, division works. Hostility works. Angry voters vote. Angry right. voters vote. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's it's uh, 
And it's a shame. It's it's hard for me to believe that this is 21st century Florida. Yeah. Right. I must say. I must say. We are going to take a short break and we will be right back. You're listening to Woke Wars. I'm Nancy Ancrum here with the team from the Miami Herald Editorial Board. At the school board level in Miami, we've seen the parental rights push cited in book bans and in a new push to review material branded as social emotional learning. This SEL, it's called, and it really helps kids develop life skills, set goals, and develop empathy, such as recognizing racism. Uh, In recent years, however, conservatives have called it a Trojan horse for teaching concepts that they deem inappropriate for school-age children. It became some parents' mantra recently at uh, a school board meeting. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Serrano, and I am with CCDF USA. Through an in-depth review of curriculum and supplemental resources within multiple school districts, we have identified a prevailing trend of the utilization of social-emotional learning, SEL, resources as a Trojan horse for the deployment of age-inappropriate content, gender ideology, and critical race theory. This school district is no exception. Resources such as Edgenuity have content that we believe violates statutes and DOE rules. My name is Ruth Swanson. I'm a community member and a, uh, been involved in education for about 15 years. Um, it's my understanding that social emotional learning teaches equity, critical race theory, and radical gender ideology. Uh, if I'm wrong about this, I would like to have some sort of correction on that, but I have also heard that the programs used for social emotional learning collect private data of students, and this violates their right to privacy. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fernando Valdez. I ask for your support for a National Day of Prayer and against the comprehensive review of emotional learning that perverts the innocence of our children at our schools. Let's give our children and our grandchildren the opportunity to grow up as children. Let's not abandon their innocence. Of course, critical race theory, which examines institutional racism, isn't taught in K through 12, but it's being used as a trigger to sink other initiatives. And many black parents are concerned that it leaves their children even more vulnerable to the racism they already face from insensitive teachers and classmates. Where is the line drawn when it comes to the idea that parents know best? Yeah, I mean, I just want to point out there's a lot of outrage in that clip that we're hearing about social emotional learning, which is something that's designed to help students become more emotionally intelligent and to be able to, um, you know, recognize emotions. And in my experience as a teacher, it's never been seen as a negative thing. So it's just interesting to see now that that's coming up. Um, And, you know, I think... Um, when it comes to the idea, you know, when do parents know best? When you, where do you draw that line? Um, I just want to say again, parental engagement is encouraged, right? We want parents to be looking at curriculum. It's posted online, um, you know, things like sex, sex education textbooks. That kind of stuff is posted online before that's reviewed and approved by the school board. And last year, I just want to say, I think, there was a very, very small percentage, like barely any parents spoke up against that uh, sex education textbook until after it came into the school board and people were talking about it. So I just want to say this opportunity to look at content that your children, is, your child is learning about has always been there. The option to opt out of something you don't feel comfortable with, that option has, has always been there. Um, and so, you know, I just think there's there's some outrage here that um, is being stirred up that that really wasn't there before, and that makes me a little bit suspicious about where it's coming from. Yeah, and I, you know, to me, the idea that um, you know these parents are in there talking about this, it's it it taps into some legitimate concerns, right? These are parents are overwhelmed. They are, you know, especially if they're working. Who has the time to do all that? You know, go through all those things. I I understand that. Um, and there's a lot for them to worry about. <laughs> like there really is. Yeah. There, you know, we've talked about this before in our meetings. But you know, when I was in school, if you got bullied, you could still go home. And now with with you know the internet uh, and on your phone, that bullying reaches you reaches right into your house. 
And how do you protect your kid from that? That's heartbreaking and terrible. Um, so I think parents are worried, and, and rightfully so, right? They have all those things to worry about. They worry about testing and, and kids being you know, penalized for the rest of their lives for, for doing one thing that then gets online. That's some serious stuff to worry about, right? Um, but I also think about the idea that you know, saying no is a form of control, right? It's, one of the, it's, one, it's the thing that kids learn right away. If you say no, it's, you're exerting some sort of control over your life. Parents saying no makes them feel in control. But are they? I mean, to me, what they're trying to do is, is something. They're trying to have the schools um, you know, do some of the things that are maybe not doable, right? I mean, you cannot protect your children completely from what's on the internet. You can't. Right. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. The societal pressure on parents and on these kids is huge. And so they're trying, you know, some of that is, is spilling over into the schools. Personally, I long for the days when school board meetings were boring. <laughs> and, and now they are like, you know, these hotbeds of politics. You know, to Amy's point, there is also the thought that there was a very good story in the Washington Post just recently about does parental rights also mean an abdication of parental responsibility? Is the school board and our teachers solely responsible for protecting children from, from gender a conversation, conversation about race and racism? Aren't these conversations also that should be held at home? And rather than banning it, uh, wouldn't it be great for kids to be able to go home and say, you know, we talked about X today. What is that? What is that about? You know, what do we think as a family? These are conversations that parents themselves might not want to have. I understand not wanting to talk to your kindergarten kid about tra transgender, you know, transgender people. I understand that. But, you know, they are extending this law um, from from uh, K to three to I think all the way through high school. Mm -hmm. And you know, by the time you're in junior high school, you have watched enough TV and seen enough movies to really form your own opinions. Nothing, is, nothing can be hidden from you. Right, and I mean, I don't think anyone's arguing that you know, parents shouldn't have a say in how they raise their children and what kind of um, you know, movies they, they show their child or what kind of content they expose their kids to. But And what's required in the classroom. Like they actually right. required books that, that there are, you know. Right. One of the parents we talked to talked about specific books that she found objectionable. Right. But, you know, there, like we said before, there are already systems in place and, and processes that, you know, um, these books have to grow through. I mean, you know, the teacher, I don't know if people understand this, but the teacher is not selecting this book because it's their favorite novel and they want to, you know, teach their students about it. You know, it comes from a list of state approved novels and books that, you know, they're a part of the curriculum for a reason. It, it, in, and I just think, if we're doubting this process and we're saying, you know, parents are the ones who should be able to choose what's in the curriculum, um, you know, what kind of books uh, my my teacher, uh, my child's teacher is um, choosing, then I think that really, um, you know, undermines the system that we already have put in place. Right. And what kids are, it's not only about what kids are not to be taught in schools. It's what they are being taught. And what they're being taught by the administration going a, a, about it in this way is you can vilify people because of what they are. You can demonize people because of their skin color. And again, that's all about division, anger, and as Amy said, angry voters vote. It's, it's, a, it's a shame. Yeah, and we also, I feel like there's a danger here that we might be hollowing out the public school system with this kind of divisiveness, with this kind of anger, making, making you know, school board um, races feel partisan, even if they haven't been designated partisan yet. Um, it's, it's, it undermines the entire system of public um, education in this country, um, which was designed to make sure we had an educated populace who would vote and be civically you know, engaged and understand how a democracy worked. And instead, what we're getting are these, you know, siloing of people, sending them to specific places, different kinds of schools. We're going backwards. That's what right. the kind of system we had before we had a public education system. Exactly. And that's going to be, I think, the result of the new voucher law, which gives vouchers to 
everyone, um, even parents, even families that can afford to, who want to send their kids to a private school, can afford to do it, but we're going to be paying for that. And I think that does get to what Amy called the hollowing out of public schools. And also, to me, it, it will, I'll be interested to watch to see if taxpayers start to get angry. Because what we all signed up to do was pay for a public education system with standards that were universal and made sure that everybody had an equal opportunity. And now what we're doing is taking those tax dollars and making them more into like, okay, well, you can use them for any kind of schooling you want. Is that really what taxpayers are yeah. supposed to have to do? I am not sure. And in the wake of the culture wars, um, there's a, an organization, a parent organization called PS305. And Lauren, I know you talked to, is it the uh, the leader? Yeah, we talked to the executive director, Mina Hosini, and you know, she she believes that the, the voucher law is a step towards privatizing education because it's diverting public dollars away from the public school system. Um, and I think it just gets, you know, it, it's this idea that school choice and parental rights are always a good thing. And on the surface, it might sound like that. But I think we have to look a little deeper and think about where is the balance when it comes to how much rights we're giving to parents and how much rights we're giving to the professionals who have, you know, been trusted to run the school system. I think there has to be that balance. You know, it's it's a good thing to have parents sitting on a committee or a board and, um, you know, reviewing books. But it also depends on who those parents are and who they have been appointed by and what their political beliefs are. You know, we have to get um, people who represent all students and who have the interests of all students in mind. Um, and that's a bit tricky in this day and age with so much, you know, division and um, just difference. And, and one more thing I wanted to mention about the, the, the role of public schools is that they are not just places where kids go to get educated. They're community resources. They play a role in keeping the community together. Right. Um, it's a place for, it, it, you know, they're shelters, they are night schools, they are all those other things. And we're acting like they are kind of disposable. And I, I just think it's a, I think it's, we are really heading in a, in a bad direction here. Yeah, I'm concerned that that's a really good word. I'm concerned that uh, we are seeing the people who, and the kids who go to many of these public schools as disposable, uh, easily dismissed and without a voice. And I think that's where parental involvement sometimes has been the hardest in, 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 in some neighborhoods, in some schools, uh, but where the need has been, you know, has been greatest. Right, and just going off of that, you know, I worked at a school where, um, you know, um, most of the parents were working most of the time. And uh, sometimes teachers have to step in as, you know, a mentor, a figure, um, a parental figure for, for students who don't have good relationships with their parents at home, who maybe don't feel safe at home. And that's the reality for a lot of kids. And I think this, you know, parental rights movement sort of silences that reality for a lot of students. It's not a nice thing. It's not something we like to think about. But there's a lot of teachers who are stepping in and, you know, um, playing double duty in the role of, like I said, mentor and, you know, even think about school lunches. That might be the first meal that kids have that day. You know, so schools, public schools are imperative and I don't think we should be working to undermine and defund them. Agreed. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to give Lauren the last word there. You have been listening to Woke Wars, and you can find more of our episodes at MiamiHerald.com slash Woke Wars. And consider subscribing to The Herald at MiamiHerald.com slash subscribe. I want to thank WLRN Studios. Our engineer today was Peter Mertz and our videographer, Jose Iglesias. We'll see you next time.